Hello and welcome to another episode of Mysteries with a History, where I'll take you on a wild ride into the unknown, the strange, and the mysterious. Like you, I have questions, and like you, I want answers. First off, I want to say hi to everyone in the live chat. Hi, Stefan Canoodles, creepy little book. How are you guys doing? Corey, uh, UFO man, thank you so much. William, Marty, and Bob. Thank you guys so much for the super chats and super stickers. You guys are fantastic. And of course, we have Jimmy Church in the chat and John aside. So today we're going to be talking about and looking into a case that to this day is as murky and mysterious as it was over 70 years ago. A real mystery with a history. On March 25th, 1948, a spacecraft of unknown origin crashed in New Mexico. Sound familiar so far? Today, we're going to talk about the Aztec crash. Is it just a hoax or a clever cover-up? There there's a lot to cover and a lot of facets to consider with this story. And you can decide for yourself if you believe it to be a hoax or a true story. It's a deep and complex case. And joining me to make sense of all of this is my co-host, Jimmy Church from Fade to Black Radio. All righty. Hey, Jimmy, you ready for this one? How you doing? Uh, You know, I am. I'm excited for today. I'm excited. I am too. This is, uh, this is a great case. And uh, just, just like everything that you select. Uh, for the show, I always uh, find uh, these subjects so compelling, but but this particular case is a very interesting one uh, for many different reasons, and and we'll get into all of that. Um, uh, one of the things that I like to do when I intro the show is letting everybody know how much I I mess with Christina. So uh, so I text her a few minutes ago. All right, hey, it's going to be a great show. She's like, it sure is. Ron in three. I said, what? Ron in an hour. <laughs> I'm not ready. And I know. Ah! Psych. Well, I'm, I'm becoming, becoming to realize more and more that I can just, I got to be more relaxed. And right now I'm drinking some really amazing green tea with honey. So it keeps my nerves down and it keeps the caffeine high. Oh, okay. Green tea has caffeine. Mm. Does it? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and it's really big, yummy. I like I'm it. I'm not a big I'm not a big tea guy. And th- you know what's weird? Um the tea that I th- that I enjoy, I can't really find. Um but uh I like cranberry tea. I like fruit teas. I don't like black tea or what are you drinking? Green tea. Yeah, see, that doesn't compute. But a nice, hot, fruity tea, a little lemon, you know, that that I dig. I do. I do. No caffeine, nothing. I just like the flavor of it. Hard to find. Hard to find. So I'm not it, I just. Eh, it keeps you, know. you nice and warm. I think it stays a little bit hotter. This is my opinion to coffee because I add milk and sugar and all that kind of stuff. But let's get into today's story. No, so. no I don't want to. I don't want to talk to UFOs today. I'm going to be talking to UFOs for the next three days. <laughs> I'm rolling awesome. here to the Conscious Life Expo. I'm cold. I've got a sweatshirt on. I'm drinking warm, warm liquid. And uh, okay, let's let's get into Aztec. Let's get into Aztec. See, I look, people. If I don't mess with you, that means you've been thrown out of the car. That's that's the truth. If somebody goes, you know, whispers, and says, Jimmy's being really nice to me. You don't want to, you don't want to make that statement. You don't want to make that statement. If, if I'm messing with you, life is good. Always remember that. Always remember that, including this audience. So uh, moving on Aztec. Um, now your opening on this is, uh, is, is pretty accurate. Uh, my first salvo into this case is more about all things New Mexico. And if we push back the date 
to that era, and you know, I always go back to Kenneth Arnold and Roswell in 1947. Let's let's not forget Roswell was squashed in 1947, and by the second week of July, the nation had forgotten about it, and that includes New Mexico. The media dropped the story. The cover-up was there, and it wasn't repeated. Uh, we're going to talk a lot today about Frank Scully and and his original statements on uh, in, in his book from 1950 about the crash at Aztec. Now, here's the deal. There was no mention of Roswell in that book. There was no mention in the media about that book, uh, uh, about Roswell. Uh, the FBI memo from Hoddle, which we're going to talk about today extensively, uh, no mention of Roswell. Roswell wasn't in the conversation. What was happening is there were crashes in, in during this period, and uh, Roswell wasn't the only one. Um, of course, we have uh, 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 the possibility of two or three crashes in and around Roswell and, and, and uh, Corona. Um, uh, we have a, a flurry of sightings and things that happened up in the Four Corners area, which is where Aztec is located, where this crash happened. But the conversation about alien bodies and crash recovery and, and a landing and, and things of this nature that uh, was being investigated and talked about was not part of the conversation anywhere, but it was happening in this area of New Mexico. It's an incredible part to the story. Now, uh, another thing that we're going to be talking about is the involvement with the FBI and, of course, the, the HODL memo. But I look at this case from three different perspectives that we have to consider all of them. Uh, and, and that doesn't include the hoax side. We have um, uh, cover-ups. We have uh, conflicting stories. Um, we have uh, uh, eyewitness uh, details with this. And we also have the military and the atomic side. All of this happening at the same time. And and the the third or fourth element to this was confusion. Was this a deliberate attempt to have not only conflicting stories, but confusing the public uh, in a deliberate sense uh, to cover something up? And I think that that, that is what Aztec represents. So uh, let, let's start to move on here. Uh, what what brought you to the Aztec case? There was something that drew you to it. What was it? What I found really interesting about this case was, one, it's one that is considered really a hoax throughout the majority of the public when it comes to the story. It has risen and fallen three times. This is a story that has been squashed three times throughout the decades, and that's what really blew my mind. But the third element that was, I was really like, oh my gosh, if it's a hoax or if it's real, it's still a really cool story. And that's the fact that there were about 16 humanoid beings that were found inside of this craft. Now, there hasn't been a case that I have come across yet where there have been so many bodies and all of them were deceased. We had Roswell that had about, what, two, three bodies, give or take. And then you've had some other incidents, but this one has been the largest number that I've seen to date. And that's really what caught my eye. K1, thank you so much for the super sticker because we have so much to cover. I'm really, really excited. And I would like to kind of briefly go over the um, summary or like the, the history about this. I, I barely touched on it on the intro, but there's a little bit more to cover with today's story. Is that okay, Jimmy? Yeah, yeah. Let's uh, let's start with the hoax side because, um, and as we go through this, I, I think the hoax part, as crazy as this may sound, it was co conveniently and pretty well uh, uh, covered up as a hoax uh, very early on, and the way that, uh, and we're going to go uh, through the hoax details. Let me get to the end of the hoax. 
we've we've got to put everything in perspective with Hoover and the FBI. One of the most effective tools, well, that they felt that Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover, thought was effective was attack somebody's credibility, um, put it out there in the public, and ruin their life. And and that was the style, that was the method of the FBI and J. Edgar Hoover. And that's exactly what happened in this case. And it just makes you wonder, because the um, I'm at the end of this. We're going to go to the beginning and, and what the hoax is in just a second. The two con men... Newton and uh, 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 Gebauer. Leo Gebauer, yeah. Yeah, Gebauer. Um, those two guys have an FBI file that is this thick. Mm-hmm. Okay? Con men. This thick. They declassified and released half of it. About 200 pages. About, about half of their file. The other half is still classified. So you, if they're just con men, what, 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 what is it that they know or what is it about these two guys that has to remain classified? I find that very interesting. And is it that these two stumbled on to something and, you know, something that they shouldn't have known and turn around and ran their mouth about it? That, that, I think that is something that we really need to consider here. Um, and the other part is because they were con men selling this, these little widget things to search for gas and gold, whatever, whatever they were called. Um, the FBI seized on that and completely discredited everything that they had to say. But my, my point is that is what the FBI did. They, they seized on this aspect of it and completely ruined their lives. Yeah, maybe they were con men. Who cares? But they probably stumbled on some secrets. Okay? All right. So now let's back up. Let's talk about the hoax. How, how, did, this, how did this come about? Well, there's a lot to cover, and I feel like we, we got to start with kind of a, a basis. And that was, first, you had Frank Scully who wrote the book Behind the Flying Saucer that was published in 1950 that really brought this story to the public. There were quite a few witnesses. There were those that claim that they had the inside knowledge to this um, retrieval of the craft. But it was Frank Scully who got the story started. And as soon as it, as it was released, it became the best seller in America, uh, selling about, what, 60,000 copies uh upon its release. And with this story, he was talking to two men, one of them by the name of Salas Newton and Leo Gebauer. What I found interesting in my research before we continue is I want to give people a little brief overview of how I do my research for my shows. First, I like to go straight up to the internet and kind of get a summary of almost all the topics that we cover on this show. This way it makes it easier to go through books and documentaries and pick out all the extra details and that summary simply doesn't cover. And then from there, that's when I kind of lead into the heavier uh, data collection. What I found on multiple websites was that Newton and Gebauer were the people that found the craft. Now, when I had read three books, three sources, one of them being by Frank Scully, one of them being by the Ramses, and the other one being by, let me pull up the name, by Steinman as well. Mm -hmm. That really wasn't true. Instead, it was found by two other men by the name of Doug, um, Doug Noland and Mm -hmm. Bill Ferguson. These were two oil men that were running up on top of the Mesa at Hart Canyon to to help with the fire, to, to, to distinguish the fire. And when that happened, they realized this huge craft and that these were the people that were kind of documenting how big it was. There were the ones that actually looked inside of the craft. They called the police. The police came and then soon after the military came or the government there no one really knows exactly what faction they came from as we've heard in a lot of ufo crashes or ufo incidents um 
these people that come from the military don't really have a patch to define exactly what department they come from, at least not all the time, but for the most part. So this is kind of where it was already beginning, becoming blurry from my research was that there were there were four people, but they were getting mixed up in in everything that I was reading. So from there, the hoax part was that Newton and Gebauer were already wealthy um, oil men, one of them, Newton, having his own oil company and Gebauer selling his uh, it was called a mag magnetotron that can hunt for gold, water and oil. Now, when I had done more research onto that in the books that I had read where people had actually talked to Gebauer, such as Frank Scully, it had only stated that the Megatron could um, only search for oil and water. It didn't say anything about gold, at least to my knowledge. So from there, that's kind of where the hoax started. Jimmy, can you kind of go more into detail about who Newton and Gebauer were? I, I was waiting for you to take a breath. I was like, man, Christina's on fire. I just read your comment. Christina's on fire. Um, okay, well, so this is, um, and not to spend a whole lot of time on this because there's so much more to get into here. Um, these two guys were selling these uh, things and uh, that would uh, uh, go out and allegedly find gold, water, oil and and they were telling their potential customers or victims however you want to look at it uh that these were given to them from aliens from a crashed flying saucer that happened a couple of years before and 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 they're um in in possession of this technology where the hoax part surfaced is that uh, when the media got a hold of this, there was a journalist and said, hey, uh, guys, give me a piece of the, this thing. You know, let's let's and, and it and and they did. And again, I'm saying all allegedly because this is where I think the FBI steps in. But that the piece of metal that was given uh, and, and analyzed turned out to be aluminum. So now it's all a hoax. These guys are, are con men. They've made up this story, and it, 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 it's all over. Okay, now, to set, let, let's get off of Newton and Gebauer for a second. Well, no, I'm, I'm going to stay with Gebauer because his name starts with a G. In Frank Scully's book, he has... Uh, a witness that he's named. I need all of this to be clear here, so everybody understands, because it gets it gets really complicated. Uh, Doctor G. Now, okay, so is this Gebauer? Well, Gebauer is not a doctor. Number one, number two, Scully says in the book that. He has interviewed multiple scientists, and the number is somewhere between 12 and 16, and uh, six or eight of these. I have Frank Scully's book here. I have the book. I have the hardcover. Um, I've read it many, many times. It's one of the greatest books in all of ufology, and even though it was written in 1950, I suggest to everybody to get this book and read it. It's good. I, I just don't have it in front of me at this moment. But, uh, yeah, I've got it with the original rap, and, yeah, it's pretty cool. Anyway, he says um, that uh, he has interviewed these scientists that uh, this craft didn't crash. It landed, and uh, the scientists were able to take the craft and analyze it. And that the Dr. G in his book is a combination of six or eight of these scientist statements. And he had compiled it all into this, this character of Dr. G. So it was, was Gebauer the source of information from Scully? Scully says, no, that Dr. G was this creation that he had to do because he couldn't reveal all of the scientists names. And, and that's what is, is there. 
Now, going back to uh, Gebauer himself, he wasn't a doctor. He was an engineer. Um, his education of uh, in engineering, was it electrical? Was it uh, other things? Was it manufacturing? D don't really know uh, that part about him, but he certainly wasn't a doctor. And I don't think that Scully would have put a doctor label on uh, Gebauer when there was no reason to do that. He could have called him an engineer, um, Engineer G. But Dr. G was a combination of that. And again, this goes back to uh, the hoax and uh, who these two characters were, Newton and Gebauer. Um, and, and, and now, so this pushes pushes everything out a little bit further. Because if we go back to the way that Scully does the recounting in the book, and then we'll get to Scott and Susan Ramsey. Um, this is what happened. They, uh, the investigators, they show up on the scene and there is uh, a, a, an apparent fire in the vicinity, number one. Number two, they go down to the craft and these guys are in the oil business. And they have certain tools with them. And I think they had like a sledgehammer. And they go up. If I have this detail wrong, uh, sue me later. But they break into a window. They they crash through that or windshield. And they were able to reach inside and flip a switch that opened up a door. And they didn't see any, there were, again, uh, no rivets, no seams, and this and that, and, you know, metal. But this door pops open, and they go inside, and that's where they, that's uh, when they find the 16 bodies, all between like 36 inches, 42 inches tall, 40 pounds each. This is in, in the book. All deceased because of a fire that happened inside of the craft. And that is another very interesting detail because if you go back to, you know, 1949, uh, 1950, and now we're talking about alien bodies, uh, this isn't a crash saucer. This is a landed saucer. Um, now, uh, th and this is where I, I go back to my detail. I, I told you to take a breath. Now I can't take a breath. Such a great case is that uh, none of these types of accounts were out in the public um, right. at that time. It, it, it was just a singular thing like this. But here's where the confusing parts to the story start to unfold. If we, if we look at the HODL memo and we look at some of the other details in this case that support it, including the witnesses, we have conflicting stories one the huddle memo clearly states three crashes three recoveries three vehicles three bodies alien beings on each one that's a total of nine that's a far shot from 16 that's confusing part number one number two in the HODL memo, can you can you post the HODL memo so everybody can see it? Do you have it in front of you? If I can not, pull it up. Okay. Um, the next part in the HODL memo is the crafts were 50 feet in diameter. The witnesses, and in Scully's book, have this craft at 90 feet in diameter. One craft, not three. 16 bodies, not nine, three times three. So, uh, and, and this memo, which uh, uh, was released early on in 1950 uh, to J. Edgar Hoover, states these facts. Okay, here it is right here. It's very uh, blurry. Uh, no, no, I, I, I got it. I got it. If you quit moving it, can you just let it... <laughs> Uh, an investigator for the Air Force stated that three individual flying saucers have been recovered in New Mexico. They were described as being circular in shape with raised centers, um, uh, approximately 50 feet in diameter. 
right there. Each one was occupied by three bodies of, right? So you can, now, this was dated March 22nd, 1950. Okay, now this was a year after the crash, which was March 25th, 1949. And this memo has been out in the public domain for quite a while. And then uh, before the vault, uh, I think the FBI put the vault together in around 2011. Again, I could have that date wrong. But it was already on the FBI website before that. But it's been a part of the vault uh, uh, since at least 2011. And one of the most viewed documents um, on uh, the entire FBI website. But what is curious about this uh, memo is that because it had been out and distributed in the public domain, and we all knew that the memo was authentic, then the FBI had to do something with it. They couldn't not publish it because then there's an issue there. Is it, Are they covering something up? So the FBI on their website dealing with this memo says, does this confirm that it was a hoax? And you can read this on the FBI's page. It says mm -hmm. it does not confirm that it was a hoax, but we don't know the whole story. So I always found that very interesting, too, as well. The Hoddle memo is, is a curious one. Um, Hoddle himself, uh, without getting into his details, but he was like he was like the boss of the Washington, D.C. office of, of the FBI. A uh, very talented guy, very smart guy. And uh, when you issue a memorandum like this to the director of the FBI, uh, the, in this case, J. Edgar Hoover, there had to have been something to it. I don't think that uh, the director of the Washington, D.C. FBI field office is going to create a memo on UFOs and send it to the director of the FBI unless there was some teeth to it, that there was something to it. Also on the memo, and then we'll move on, scribbled uh, on the memo is a note, and it says, flying saucers or flying disc? And I always thought that that was interesting too as well, and I don't know who wrote that. Okay. So now I'm going to flip this back over to you. That's that's some of the beginning. I haven't you covered gotten... a lot. No, I think I think you covered a good chunk of it. And first, I just would like to say thank you so much to E for sending the um, super sticker and UFO man as well. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel. So, Jimmy, you covered a lot. And there are some things that I want to mention on. But let, let, let's stay on the hoax aspect before we get into some other details. So the person that's kind of released the fact that this is not a true story was the name, uh, the, the man by the name of J.B. J.P. Can. Now, he was a journalist for the San Francisco Chronicles, and it states in the book Aztec Incidents by the Ramses that him and Scully had some kind of relationship. Mr. Can wanted to actually buy the rights of the Aztec story and then sell it on his own, right? So he's going to he's going to pay Scully off so that Can can have the story. Mm -hmm. But what turns out is that Scully goes ahead and says, you know what? I don't want to sell it to you. I don't think the price that you're giving me is sufficient enough. I know the story is going to do amazing. I'm going to go ahead and keep it and release it myself. So for some people, they might consider this to kind of relate to a sense of um, pettiness. And but before I continue the story, let's look at um, human instinct for an example. When we're in a career, whatever career that may be, you always want to outdo somebody else, which is an awful case, right? It's called ego, but that's just how it is. So with a really hot story like this, UFOs, aliens, during this time, the 19, the late 1940s, early 1950s, the topic was still kind of hot. Yes, Roswell kind of died out rather quickly, but for some people, that ambition, that kind of curiosity was already peaked. It already got started. So having another story just come out eight months later was 
going to be rather exciting. And you had a lot of science fiction books coming out around this time that were related to aliens coming from Mars or coming from Venus. And so it seems that based off of my understanding from the that book in particular that I read, The Aztec Incident, it was practically stating that Can was rather jealous of um, Scully having this story, and he was going to do whatever he could to go ahead and debunk Scully, his story, and his book, because he already saw how amazing it was doing, becoming one of the best sellers in the United States, and he couldn't have that for himself. So that's when he himself, Can reaches out to President Hoover and to get the government involved into looking into Newton. Newton and Gebauer. And that's where I found it. It was kind of interesting. Now, Jimmy, I'm going to jump it over to you. I think I'm going to restart restart my router rather quickly. No, no, no. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. Don't worry about it. Your audio's perfect. Okay. Yeah, your audio's because I'm freezing. I'm freezing. So yeah, we're all freezing. I've got a I've got a a, oh, you're talking about something else. Um, you're fine. Your audio is perfect. Okay, I, I, I could just sit here and listen to you forever and not uh, say another word. Here, okay, don't worry about your router. This is uh, going to Scott and Susan Ramsey, who, uh, by the way, um, are two of the most incredible people just in general. They, they are just absolutely amazing, and I've had the opportunity to hang out with them. It, their research into this I think it's a it's 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 personal, but they're also excellent researchers. But she she grew up in that area in, in Aztec, and uh, this this story was a personal thing for her. She wanted to get to the bottom of it. But the other part is they because they're local, they are able to go, seriously put boots on the ground and go to not only to the site. But uh, and, and chase down witnesses and chase down details and chase down paperwork, uh, which is I- extremely extensive in, in their books. Um, but uh, go out and video and capture this stuff. And this is where, for me, uh, this, this gets really interesting. Because the argument is... Uh, uh, you have an advanced craft. You're an advanced civilization. How can you travel 10,000 light years and get here and then, you know, crash? You know, don't you have better gear? Get to, you know, and, and, and right there, it's just like, stop. Stop with that. Number one, this wasn't a crash craft. This was a landed craft. Number two. We crash stuff here on this planet all the time. (laughs) Plane crashes, helicopter crashes, crashes, crash, drone, whatever. Stuff crashes. Accidents happen. Okay? We had uh, two shuttle disasters. We did. Those are pretty advanced craft on our own planet through an atmosphere that we are supposed to understand accidents happen number one number two i think that's the most powerful statement that i can make with this accidents happen but number two if we can't control and perfect our own aircraft aerospace uh in industries and technology on a planet where we live and understand if you're arriving from another star system to a, a planet that you don't know much about, how is it uh, a question that you might have issues, not only with the atmosphere, but with our own technology? What is going on here? Because our technology, no matter how advanced another civilization is, they are studying us. They aren't inventing this technology that we have, primitive or advanced. Uh, Also, technologies that we may not fully understand ourselves. And I'm talking about nuclear, electromagnetic, radar, radio, microwaves, 
Okay. Yeah, we use it, but we don't fully understand it. Look what happened with uh, the 5G rollout last month. The 5G technology has been worked on for a very long time. Suddenly, they're getting ready to flip the switch last week, two weeks ago, and all of the commercial airline companies around the world are freaking out. We're not ready for 5G yet. Wait a minute. Now, that's happening on our own planet and could possibly interfere with GPS and navigation systems on commercial aircraft. That's here. This is our technology that we're developing. Now, you're a, uh, uh, extraterrestrial civilization bringing a craft into this atmosphere. How do you know everything that could possibly interfere with your craft? Accidents happen. This all is the time. All Did the you time. mention the Los Alamos radar station? That's where I'm going right now. Okay. Okay. Continue. So Scott and Susan Ramsey address this point beautifully, and they also do it with boots on the ground. Let me explain. Radar. Radar is, is, is complex. It's also broad. Narrow in its uh, in in its uh, frequency, but broad in what it can do. Okay, so the question arose: Well, wait a minute. Uh, it, radar couldn't have been involved because there wasn't anything around in that part of New Mexico at that time, and it, and it turned out that Scott and Susan Ramsey not only showed evidence of radar installations in that area three that formed a triangle by the way uh, uh from a aztec down to albuquerque and then out uh east is is this from 1946 this accident happened in 1949 government documents will show that the air force didn't come in with radar until 1950 crash happened in 1949 that wasn't true the radar installations, the three main ones in, in this part of New Mexico, were built and maintained by uh, the Atomic Energy Commission. Why? Well, they said at that time, remember, there wasn't supposed to be any radar up there, but that turned out not to be true. Los Alamos, uh, uh, Kirkland Air Force Base, Sandia National Labs, where all of the atomic research was being done at that time. And, of course, Kirkland Air Force Base were at the center of this, and they installed these radar installations to protect them from any invasion force that would come in and bomb these facilities. And that's why these three radar installations uh, were put in there. And one of them was extremely powerful. Now, the reason why I bring this up, could this have brought down the UFO? That's not even the main point that, that this could have interfered with this. And including, uh, and I didn't even get to White Sands yet, including the Roswell crash. But here's the point. It's the lie that was put out to cover up this story. It's another confusing element of this that was put out there, that there was no radar. Well, it turns out there was. That's what is important. It, did, did, is it part, Well, if, if uh, you keep the story straight and everything lines up, that's one thing. But if you're going to suggest something else to uh, discredit this story, and then it turns out that that wasn't true, that that was a lie, well, then what else here is a cover-up, including Newton and Gebauer and, and other situations with this? And then uh, the other confusing part to this story, and I've got, man, I, I just get angry uh, when I talk about Aztec, is White Sands, because people say, well, you know, the radar installations were, you know, at, at White Sands. The radar installations at White Sands, uh, number one, were leftover rudimentary uh, World War II radars that were brought in because they had V-2 rockets that they had captured over in Europe, and they were firing those over in White Sands, and they were t following the trajectory of of uh, the rockets that they were test firing that they, they captured from the Germans. A totally different radar installation than the three that were installed up and around Albuquerque, New Mexico, to protect everything that was up there. 
right in the middle of where the Aztec, the Aztec landing happened. I mean, there, there's so much of it, and there's much more uh, detail to this story. But, but again, accidents happen, crashes happened. Uh, could this craft have uh, come in and there was an issue with it? Uh, they weren't planning on landing. Uh, did the radar burn up something on the interior of the craft and, 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 and cause a fire? Possibly. Did it interfere with their navigation and their flight control systems? Possibly. Were they forced into landing to try to fix something? Possibly. But it wasn't a crash, Christina. That's what I heard as well. Thank you so much, Mark, for the super sticker. What I found kind of bizarre that I couldn't find any more information on was after this either guided landing or crash, the inside, these 16 beings were charred black, saying that there was a burn inside, but there was no description of if the inside of the craft showed any burn marks. Yes, there were some hieroglyphs. Yes, we we saw they had claimed that they had seen some... Um, like some breakage inside of the craft, but I didn't read anything of it showing any burns of any kind, either electrical or who knows whatever else. Uh, the soul of Sith Pop, thank you so much for the super sticker. And Jimmy, I want to ask you more about that, but we are coming up against a break and we will be right back after this. Hi, I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation, and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. So, Jimmy, from your research, did you ever encounter any descriptions of what the inside of the craft looked like? There is a, 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 there are a few different. Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, the longer answer is I would recommend uh, Scott and Susan Ramsey's uh, book, uh, which is not only excellent but they reveal stuff that wasn't uh, uh, disclosed back in 1950 with Frank Scully. And uh, it's a it's an extraordinary read. Um, and I went to go and get it uh, before the show today, and and I didn't. I wanted to just show everybody the cover of the book, but it, it's excellent. Scott and Susan Ramsey. Um, but um, okay, but here's here's uh, the other part uh, for me uh, that I, I, I kind of want to dive into. I keep going back to what was going on in 1950 in 1950 and it's it's hard for us to understand now because it was so long ago but you have to understand the state of mind of the country and the world it was just five four three years after world war ii and the the fear um, the recovery, the emotional aspect of this was just like yesterday. And and here we are. We're in 2022, right? It's like talking about something from 2018. It was th that's. I lost internet. Uh, no, you didn't. 
Oh man. Christina is uh I could go back and just watch her commercial. Is this is the state of my I lost my internet. I'm out. You can't do that. Ask me if it's okay. <laughs> because you're fine. You're fine. You're so it, relax. Drink that green tea. Dr drink that green tea. It's the state of mind of 1950. And uh, not only are we talking about uh, the nuclear aspect and the secrets and the secrecy and and the reasons to keep your mouth shut about things. The government wasn't revealing stuff to the public. And, you know, the whole, added, you know, uh, loose lips sink ships. Everybody knew this. There was that. But there was something else that surfaced at this time um, that is part of the public record. And that is Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And... What is uh, Wright Pat doing popping up in this conversation back then that this craft was taken? Remember, this was some of the chatter that went on with Roswell, but there was two versions of the Roswell story. There was the one that was released in the Roswell Daily Record, the press release by Halt, uh, Hout, um, uh, the, uh, the PR person uh, for Roswell Army Airfield at the time, then the silence after that. There was no conversation about Wright Pat. There was no conversation about flying saucers being taken to Wright Pat, but it was with Aztec. It was. And it's it's a mind blowing for me, a mind blowing part of this when the secrecy that was in the state of New Mexico, we have to understand and not lose sight of uh, this probably most important fact the smartest people in the world, the highest tech on planet Earth, was in the state of New Mexico. New Mexico was on a secrecy lockdown. All of it. Not only did you have Los Alamos, but you had White Sands. And you had Roswell Army Airfield, soon to be Air Force Base, uh, with its nuclear capabilities, the most uh, a secretive, the, the ultimate thing on planet Earth going on in the state of New Mexico. Let's not lose sight of that. And for this conversation to, to start again um, in New Mexico about alien bodies and, and flying saucers is very, very important. And the one thing that uh, Washington had to do, and that includes Hoover and the FBI, was cover this story up. They had the right uh, investigative teams, they had the right scientists, uh, researchers, uh, military capabilities to go in, get this craft, analyze it, and cover it up and keep it a secret. That was 1950. Do not lose that. That was the state of mind, not only of the state of New Mexico or the United States, but the entire world. Well, we know in order to keep a secret, it leads to a lot of deception and a lot of lies as well. Corey states, Gadget Trinity went off in 45, Roswell happened in 47, Aztec in 48, all within a 300-mile radius. CIA, NSC, Air Force, all created in 47. That's right doesn't seem like that's really a coincidence. Now, something that you had mentioned, I actually have the quote for talking about World War II and the Cold War. Scott Ramsey stated in his book, I honestly think in 1948, this is right after World War II. We're only three Three years after World War II, the Cold War was going on. I think our government was absolutely smart in not letting our enemies know that we had recovered one, two, three, maybe four flying saucers. Why would we let the Russians know that that kind of technology was there? We were better off to make it look like a hoax, ridicule the people that saw it, then take the technology and try to figure it out because if we've got it, God bless that it's a lot better than if they have it. And in this sense, if you're back in that mentality at that time. If you are in that mentality back at that time. Come on, Christina. 
Because when it comes to the military, you always want to have the upper hand against your adversaries. So it would make perfect sense to collect these very advanced craft and then attempt to make other projects that can help you in any kind of war that may be present um, at a future date. So I think it's not necessary. I wouldn't. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. It's not anything out of the ordinary to consider these kinds of crashes to be kept very, very secret, very, very hush hush, and to ridicule the people that went ahead and really did see this thing if they really did see it. And that's why this story is so complex. There's a lot of people with their fingers on a lot of different pies. And practically three times the story has risen and then it got buried once again and that's again what really really caught my interest is that particular aspect of it now today there is a plaque uh, placed right where the crash allegedly happened that was placed in 1999, um, where people can go ahead and visit where it might have been. So there's a lot of hikers, there's a few tourists and people that go um, cycling that can go ahead and visit that exact location. And even though people might still consider it a hoax or a true story, I think having a plaque there, um, again, piques people's interest to do more research into the story and then to make their own conclusions on what they believe. I had also looked into the aspect of the story from those that are debunkers that went ahead, saw the information, read the books, did whatever else, and then kind of go ahead and state what they believe. Here is my issue with debunkers. Debunkers are not skeptics. They are people that are trying to push something. And no matter what kind of data they receive, they're going to state it as, well, I believe this because of my own uh, my own uh, credibility, my own knowledge, my own experience. So there were quite a few debunking websites that I read. And with the ones that I did stumble across was, it was very opinionated. There wasn't a lot of evidence to go ahead and back up why they believed what they did. Now, when it comes to the hoax aspect and you have Newton and Gebauer, sure, I can totally understand that aspect of that, that they really did go to court. They really did have, to, they were sentenced to prison, which they never really went to prison um, for for their kinds of, uh, for I guess it, for, for fraud, thank you. Yeah. But then later on, it was considered that it wasn't really fraud. They were just kind of placed in, in a corner for um, whatever reason that may have been. It's still kind of murky. A lot of that data is still not made to the public. That's why, like, like how you had said earlier, the files on these people are rather thick and only about 100 pages were released to the public and yet a lot of it was still redacted and that's the weird thing which I want to mention exactly on that Mark thank you again and let me read to you exactly what the FBI website states on Mr. Newton let me pull it up because I have it where is it so I went ahead and I looked at the FBI website, which I actually found on one of the debunker websites because he had went ahead and stated, well, Newton was totally a con man. This is what it says on the FBI website that I copied and pasted. It says, Newton was a wealthy oil producer and con man who claimed that he had a gadget that could detect minerals and oil. He was cited as an authority in Frank Scully's book, Behind the Flying Saucer, a work that claimed to report on several UFO crashes in the area of New Mexico. In 1950, Newton said that a flying saucer crashed on land he leased in the Mojave Desert. However, he revised his claim in 1952, saying he never saw a flying saucer, but had only repeated comments he heard from others. These files these files detailed the FBI's investigation into Newton's fraudulent activities between 1951 and 1970. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's that's a pretty that's a pretty big statement. And I can and I can see why it's this case would still be considered a hoax simply based off that really sliver of information that was given to us by the FBI, which for a lot of people, even though we might not believe that. Christina's on fire today. Man, I, I, I'm looking at me. I'm focused. <laughs> I'm just, she's on fire. 
She's on fire. Now, I'm going to uh, expand on, are you back? Man, you're on fire. I need some green tea. I need, to get, I need to, I need to, I need, I need, I need the hookup. Is the it's first, pretty good. is the first cup free? Heck yeah. With, but it has to have honey in it. It makes it like extra flavorful and TMI. Thank you, my friend. But green tea and okay, I really like white tea, but I didn't have it at the store. So I had to go to green tea, which is still good, but it's not as great as white tea. Have That's you had right. green tea ice cream? I have. It's, yeah, pretty, it's good. pretty good. It's pretty good. It's kind of, it's kind of yeah. bitter, but I can dig it. I, you know, the first time I had, man, let's get back to UFOs. The first time I had green tea ice cream, I had to be talked into it. I'm like, man, it's dessert, man. You know, it's, it's, <laughs> I'm like, man, green tea ice cream. And I just, hey, man, it's pretty good. This well, is, this is pretty good. A anyway, um, no, hold on. While we're on the topic, for those that are listening, I just want to let you know if you ever go to Starbucks, the best drink, my favorite drink of all time is a green tea frappuccino with Java chips. It's going to change your life for whoever who tries it. It's ain't, ain't fantastic. Changed, ain't changing my life. Oh, 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 just you wait. It's really, really delicious. No, this is what I do. Uh, okay. When I, I don't go to Starbucks often, but when I do, venti white chocolate mocha hot with four ad shots Ooh. or a total of six shots of espresso. My, 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 my. All right, let's get back. What a better way. And to see, it, it, you're a hundred percent correct. If you go to any of these debunking sites or go to Wikipedia, go to anywhere that wants to deal with debunking the Aztec story, they state one thing and one thing only. A couple of con men, man. A couple of Hong Kong con men were trying to sell these widgets, and they made up the story. That's the argument. It's that's, that's it. That's the only thing that is out there. And that's not enough for anything. That's it, It's simply not. Period. There is so much more to this story. And, and for those out there and, and anybody that wants to come at me with that, we have a long conversation that we're about to have that they can't address any of it. But what a convenient ruse. What a convenient ruse. Man, it's a couple of con men made up the story and they had to make money and they had to go and, and, and sell these things. And they're in New Mexico and and uh, the petroleum industry is kicking off. The oil industry is kicking off. And and while you're out there searching uh, for your oil, hey, man, go find some water, too. You need some water? We can cover that. You need some gold? You want to mine for gold? Mine for so We can cover that, too, as well. It was all a hoax. It was all made up by these two con men. That's a perfect, that's, a, that's the ultimate way to bring this down. And that's what the FBI did. And let's not... Why did the FBI do this? Why? Let me tell you why. J. Edgar Hoover sat on a secret with his butt that he firmly understood with his firm butt more than anybody. And that is, underneath that suit, he was wearing women's clothes. Right. And, 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 and he's going to work every day, <laughs> putting a suit on over a bra and panties. And he's sitting on those woman's undergarments, knowing full well, if this ever got out, I would be ruined. Oh, wait a minute. I can do this to everybody else. And that's why it became de 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 deflect, absolutely destroy everybody else's lives like this, with this, because J. Edgar Hoover had that fear in the back of his mind all the time. He thought about this a lot. And that's what you do. You go and ruin people's lives. Think about that. Right? And I'm on the record. I'm going right now. <laughs> that is exactly what is behind the Aztec story. Up, oh, up, oh, up, oh, Christina. As I sip my white chocolate mocha. Christina, come back to us. 
Uh, hides and long grass. Jimmy, you know too much about wearing women's underwear. No, I don't. You want me, you want me to now come on, man. <laughs> From from what I understood when it came to the government, the FBI, and Hoover looking into this account was for two reasons. One, Hoover was already interested in the crashes that would happen during his presidency. He had already informed the FBI that whatever crashes appear, he wants to be the first to know. That was one aspect. Then we had another aspect that's coming from the Ramsey's book stating that, well, can uh, JP can who had stated that this whole story was a hoax that he had published in a magazine was because he couldn't simply get the rights of the story. So due to his certain connections, as he did had as he had worked for the military in aspects that we're not really too familiar with at this point in time, as he had already passed away, we cannot ask him these questions, that he had was in the military for a short period of time, and then entered straight into journalism. But with that, we are aware, allegedly, there are rumors that he was able to contact maybe some high officials that were that could look into the two main characters being Newton and Inkebauer and to bring them down. And that's what I found interesting when it came to court based off of, again, Ramsey's book. When they were trying to collect all the uh, information using FOIA to see how these 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 court case went with them, was that their trial kept on being pushed off, even though they were considered con men, even though that they were considered to to uh, sell fraudulent products or do kind of um, illegal uh, investments of of some site some sort. Hides and long grass. Thank you. Even though these were all the case. The trial kept being pushed back. They were then claimed to um, need to go to prison, but they never went to prison. They bailed out and then they went back to living their normal lives for the most part, even though there was still some ridicule attached to them. And I don't think their business did as well as before that case. But with all of that, that's what I found really interesting. No matter all of this information that was placed upon them, at least allegedly, these con men, they should have ended up in prison. E even if they were bailed out, they could have gone through that court process again and be in prison. But that wasn't the case. Why? Well, maybe, and this is just an assumption, maybe the information that the court was trying to place upon them just wasn't sufficient enough to place them life in prison. Now, I'm not too sure, but that's kind of could be a possibility. Can I get a word in? Please. Can I can I get a word in? Hey, you're on fire today. It's you're on tea. fire today. Let me let me let me put the other spin on this. Mm. Um I think, and this goes back to uh quite a few uh different characters and individuals and personalities that are running around in ufology today. And that is you can't you can't put these guys on the stand and suddenly give them the opportunity to spill the beans you can't do that you can't that's the danger zone you come into and second if you then do that then you have to present what in in their defense what if they start asking for documents? What if they start pulling other witnesses on the stand? What if they start pulling in the and the next thing you know, all of New Mexico gets unraveled and 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 what is going on there because of a case like this? Government's not going to allow that to happen. It's better to uh, call these guys crazy and just let them run off into the sunset. You can't turn around and do that. You can't. You can't. And so, uh, any any prosecutor or anybody with powers inside of the Justice Department and the military that is looking at a case like this, no, no, we are not going to give them the opportunity to pull our documents and our people onto the witness stand to discuss this stuff. No, this is uh, this is going to go in the other direction, and and that's that's where we're at with this. And I'm. 100% positively convinced that that is the case when it comes to Newton and uh, Gebauer. Um, now, I wanted to, uh, to, to say something else uh, to this end. When uh, uh, this started to surface, 
and the other with Scully. And I'm talking about in 1950. At that time, there was the ability to go and talk to people that are still alive, that are still involved with this, and that was right there. I think that there were aspects of the story that were corroborate, co- corroborated and and verified. And, and that's why Scully turned around and chose to put this in his book as fact, as an actual event that happened. We can't uh, uh, get away from that aspect of this. The government also knew this, where they know that there are certain secrets and things that uh, nobody should know. So how could Newton and Gebauer suddenly know these things that apparently nobody should have known about? And they were completely cognizant and aware of what was going on, Christina. And and so that is the best way. Obfuscate, start putting out different versions of the story, uh, uh, the radar parts of the story. Let's confuse that. Let's... Uh, uh, was it three craft? Was it one? Was it 16 occupants? Was it three? Uh, what was the size of the craft? It, let, let's get all these different versions of the story out there. And that's what they did. Ultimately, that's that's what happened with Aztec. And let's take another spin on that. I mean, let's consider the possibility of, well, why was this information leaked to begin with? Why was this story leaked to begin with? Well, possibly, and this is just we're just adding a, another another layer to this cake that we're making, Jimmy. Possibly, the U.S. intelligence community is is known to have made use of the UFO controversy as a tool of psychological warfare in the 1950s. It is conceivable that such stories were deliberately spread at the height of the Cold War to try and convince the Soviets, the Soviets and the U.S. had access to a technology that the Soviets could only dream of. Do you think that's a possibility? Yes, of course. Of course. <clears throat> and it, it's so easy uh, today to look at things uh, with a different lens. But back then... It was a race, and not only was it a race, uh, because technologies were emerging quickly. Things were happening very fast, and we today we don't we don't understand that we we weren't a part of that. If you go back to uh, 1940, 1940, three decades before that, four decades before that. We didn't have light bulbs, right? We didn't have cars. We we were riding horses, and 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 in 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 forty short years, nineteen hundred to nineteen forty, nineteen hundred to nineteen forty, we went from covered wagons to jet planes and atomic bombs, radio, music, television radar boom in in 40 short years how do you do that it was like this race to technology and and what caused this huge advancement in everything all at the same time by the time we got to 1947 i'm talking about the alien presence could that be part of this i don't uh, i i have no idea what kind of concept uh, you had to grasp onto. If you were born in 1900, if you were born in 1890, and your family literally had nothing, no electricity, no cars, <laughs> no radio, nothing was going on at the house. You were lucky if you had books. And then when you turn the age of 50, you you know, but you were 10 years old looking at your family walking everywhere. Think about that. And then in 1940, you've got cars and jets and atomic bombs and radar and radio and television and things. It it was a race. What happened? How did that all occur at the same time? By 1947, we had not only uh, the transistor being revealed and this huge... 
But by 1947, now we've got the CIA, we've got the Air Force, we've got all these tremendous uh, uh, changes in society moving forward in 1947. Is it all a coincidence? And then right then, 1947, not only the crash at Roswell, eight months later, eight months at the same time, you have Aztec. So that is, that's the mindset of everybody. So what, what do the Russians have? What did the Germans have? You know, these concepts of heavy water and radar and, and self-flying bombs and rockets and the time. It was a crazy, and, and nobody knew what the other side had. Nobody knew how quickly things were going to move forward. All we knew that here is that we couldn't keep up with the technology that was happening every single day. It was another advancement. It was something, it was, it was uh, uh, an amazing time, not only to be alive, but to keep secrets, to keep secrets, to keep the lid on things. And that's what Washington was dealing with, Christina. I mean, I don't even know what to say to that because what, what you're saying makes sense. And in, in some respects, it's exciting. to It's intriguing to know this information. In other aspects, it's pretty disappointing. There is one more thing I would like to add to today's story, and that is allegedly there are rumors that there was one particular person that actually got photos of this craft. That's right. I forgot all about that. Okay, keep going. I'm sorry to interrupt. Keep going. <laughs> This one is, has been in multiple books. It's not just one, but in multiple. And it was practically stating, well, this one man, which we're, we don't know what his name is, had pictures of the craft. And allegedly, he was trying to sell these photos. And he was approached by a man in Denver, Colorado, to say that, he will buy these photos for a large sum of money. We don't know how much that was, but we know that it was a pretty big amount. Later, we find out, again, this is rumored, that that man was connected to the FBI or the um, Army Counterintelligence Division. And what they wanted to do was to buy all of the pictures that were on the market related to the Aztec flying saucer. That's the bottom right. line on that one is that the government took the Aztec saucer very seriously, at least in this aspect of the story. If there was no Aztec saucer, they would not have been willing to pony up a bunch of money to buy some of these photos, whether they existed or not. And I feel like that's like a, a, a nice way to kind of to kind of tie everything up because this happened a few years after the incident. Well, why would first off the the people these these high end people these military personnel possibly even know that one man has real pictures of the Aztec spacecraft? How come we don't know? How come they don't know that it was all just a hoax or a ruse just to make some extra dough? Why would they claim to spend so much money to take them off his hands, take off these photos? Have you seen the pictures? I have not. Have you? I can't find them. No, can't find them. And, it's only drawings. Uh, and it's only drawings. Yeah, so you have tried, though, right? That, which is the interesting part. Um, I would suggest to anybody to do this. Type in Aztec UFO crash New Mexico photograph. I haven't done that search in a while, but I've tried. Um, I actually did maybe about six months ago. Uh, but, but go and do it. It just takes you to a painting. Now, the, the photographs are uh, available for sale, right? You can see there's plenty. This is my memory. Uh, maybe things have changed today. Christina, while we're online right now doing the show, I want you to search. Search. Can you search? Search. Search Aztec UFO photograph. And, and they will offer it to you, right? Now, Grab what the search result shows you and then post the image. I haven't seen it. I haven't done it, but I've, <laughs> I've done this enough in the past. It's fascinating what's going on out there with this. 
there is uh, a lot of uh, 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 a lot of people out there trying to make money on this. It, it's pretty funny. Okay, you got it. Mm-hmm. Almost. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gassy, Gassy. I um, uh, while this is popping up, the uh, the rumors, the urban legend about the Aztec photographs is a crazy one. And it's been going on for uh, decades now. Um, uh, I believe that there are photographs. I do. I don't think that this surfaced from nowhere. Um, I believe uh, the photographs are out there. I don't know if they're in private hands, if they've been, uh, you know, the negatives and the original images, um, you know, grabbed by, uh, okay. So this is when I typed in, the Aztec crash photographs. This is what I got instead. There are the the two famous men. We got Newton and Gebauer. You have some drawings. That, that that drawing right there. Go up in the middle. That one right there. That's what I remember popping up for sale. Right <laughs> as the UFO Aztec photograph. Right there, that one. And uh, uh, that that brings back memories. Uh, that right there. Oh, there's the window being broken with the sledgehammer that I talked right. about. Yeah, that I talked about earlier. And what was interesting was when I read in the book by Frank Scully, he had stated that it wasn't a sledgehammer, but actually a pole that they entered in inside some kind of like a porthole. And this way, it it kind of opened this door where the men could go ahead and look inside. I, so- I, I, I thought Scully said that they got a button. That they reached in, maybe it was a portal, uh, but portal, uh, portal. Oh, okay, Christina, <laughs> if you insist, and, and they reached in and whoop, a, a door opened. Uh, but it, it's been a while since I, I've uh, read Scully's book. But uh, anyway, what were we just talking about before that? We we're talking about the photographs. Yeah, the photographs. So I, I, I want to go back to. Um, and this is my memory, but around 1995 or so, I, yeah, 1995, 1995, does that mm-hmm. sound like a long time ago to you? Does that sound like, let me ask yeah, you. Yeah, it's so long I wasn't even born yet. Yeah, it, does that sound like ancient history? 19, no, I'm being serious. It's an honest question. No, it's, it's, no, it doesn't. 1995. It doesn't to you? Okay. Yeah. Well, back in 1995, and, and I got my Interbox. And uh, I my memory says I saw one of the photographs from Aztec. That's my memory. Like, I saw it. And uh, this is my memory, and I've tried to go, I've looked at, I've tried to find the, the Aztec images, and I've looked at everything that is out there on the net, or at least I think I have, uh, to go back to what I had originally saw. What I saw was uh, a circular craft, big, sitting up again on the ground, Sitting up against, uh, there was some hills, some mountains in the black and white, obviously in in the in the background, and it's sitting there. But there were uh, a a bunch of men standing in front of it, like looking back at the camera, like they were posing. That that's what I remember. Now I don't I don't know. I have I tried to go back and find that photograph that I originally saw. Can't find it. Can't find it. Yeah, and if it was, um, if it was a fake photograph, uh, I don't even think Photoshop was out back then. But if it was something that somebody had uh, generated or created, uh, it would be out there on the net. It would be all over the place. I haven't been able to find it. Not not the original one that that I saw. And I've tried to find the Aztec photographs many times. That no, they are completely scrubbed from the net. The only thing that shows up is that painting that uh, you just put on the screen. Yeah, which is which is a pretty detailed painting. Hides in Long Grass asks, was the Aztec case called 
was the Aztec case called something different back in the early 1980s. Okay. Um, that's a great question, Aztec. There were um, uh, not only the 80s, we can go into the 90s too as well. Um, you have uh, Stanton Friedman's book, I believe it was Stanton, uh, Crash at Corona. Corona is Roswell. Okay, so that's, uh, in, in other words, South. Yeah, uh, to put all of this in context, and I understand it gets uh, confusing at times that uh, uh, we're talking about New Mexico and everybody thinks that all of these crashes are happening uh, down that way. And, and that includes uh, uh, some other, you know, uh, the Zamora case and, and things. No. Okay. Aztec is 300 miles north. Okay, almost uh, up. It's in the four corners area of of Colorado, New Mexico, and and Arizona. What's over here? Kansas, Nebraska. I don't know. I'm not a geography student, but but this is so. It's it, it's different. But back to uh, the question. There was another case that involved. Um, students from a university in Pennsylvania, um, again, uh, petroleum and oil. Christine, I was talking to you about this the other day when we were talking um, on the phone. Um, and, and those witnesses and how that was discovered and that crap. And so don't confuse that case with the Aztec case as well. So, yes. Uh, uh, so, no, it wasn't called anything different. Aztec has always been Aztec. But there are so many different uh, uh, UFO crash recovery landing uh, cases throughout New Mexico that it's easy to confuse all of these. And they happen at such such as kind of the same time period. So it makes it even more confusing as well when you're getting all these dates just a few months, maybe a year off, maybe a little bit more than that. But it's just it's a lot happening in a rather short period of time. Interbox changed. <laughs> Christina, you're the best. And uh, I'm, everybody, I am literally packed up and ready to go. So as soon as we wrap here, I'm going to take my last couple sips of coffee. And then I've got to head to uh, LAX for the Conscious Life Expo. And I'll see everybody there. Chrissy Newton's going to join me. Your friend. That's right. Yeah, Chrissy's going to be there and uh, looking forward to that. Uh, what's on the agenda for next week? I don't know yet, but I when it comes up, you'll be the first to know, as always, like almost every week. Well, who are you interviewing Ronan? Ronan, Ronan. thank you so much That's for the of, super sticker. That's I'm a gonna lot go, of It's going to go straight to the internet this time. Oh, because uh, my goodness. <laughs> So up. thank you so much. And I'm super duper excited for you to be a part of the Conscious Life Expo, but I'm not super duper excited for how crap my internet is. I already had two technicians come in. I've been on the phone for about like every single day for a week and then like a, literally a month of that and no one fixes my problems. Here's the, here's the deal though. When it's good, it's really good. <laughs> and when it's bad, my goodness, is it bad? You know, when uh, everybody wants to know, when are you going to come out and hang out at a, at a conference with us? Who knows? And no. I don't know either. What do you mean you don't know? When when the opportunity presents itself, maybe, but school is always a problem when it yes. comes to scheduling okay. anything. Okay, I'm going to put this over. Uh, I've got one minute before I have to go. I'm going to put this in the chat room. If we get donations going right now, maybe we can purchase Christina's presence at a, at a conference. She could pay off her teachers. She could, uh, you know. Uh, it costs uh, a lot of a lot to bribe professors at the university. Yeah, it does, but we can of take care of it. Um, I could arrange the opportunity uh, for a conference. I mean, I think this is this is the deal. I think you need to uh, come and hang out with us. Conferences are great, and you know, you know Chrissy's awesome, and it's going to be fun. But it would be really cool if you and Chrissy were walking around together at the Conscious Life Expo. Got to be the whole debrief team. They they got to have their own booth and be a part. 
Yeah, that too. And and just then, see, you bring up the debrief, and the CIA runs interference just like that. What a great show today, Christina. Uh, thank you so much. And and to everybody that is uh, heading uh, to Los Angeles, and you're going to be at the Conscious Life Expo, I'll see everybody down there. Christina, I want you to be safe. Give my Oh, the article today in, in the debrief, Chris Mellon. Huh? Did you read it? Of course. You read that whole thing? It was like it was it was like the old testament. I was like, I I it was so long. I was like, man, Chris. For those that haven't read it, please do so. It's it's a pretty big drop. And um everyone a part of the debrief was rather excited to have Chris Mellon write an article for them. So go take a look at that. Jimmy, thank you so much for today's show right being a part of it right before you jump over to conscious life expo we will talk next week bye everybody bye and how did you guys like today's show i thought it was a lot of fun because this one's is i think so far one of the most controversial topics that we've talked about when it comes to a ufo crash here on this show there are so many facets to the story there are a, a pot of people to talk about in this story and it can be really confusing if you don't have a pen and paper hopefully you followed along nicely we didn't get to cover everything but we did cover a decent amount to kind of give you a nice overview of what the Aztec crash is all about. I want to say thank you to all of my Patreons, um, all of the YouTube members, Super Chats, Super Stickers, everyone for joining us here live on YouTube to watch Mysteries with a History. I will see you pretty soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies.